Just moments ago, the final three indicted fake electors in Arizona, including two close allies of former President Trump, pleaded not guilty to charges related to efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Trump attorneys and advisors Boris Epstein and Jenna Ellis, along with failed 2022 Republican Arizona Senate candidate James Lamont, now join the rest of the 18 co-defendants in this case who have pleaded not guilty to fraud, forgery, and conspiracy charges. Joining us now is former U.S. attorney and MSNBC legal analyst Barbara McQuaid and NBC's Vaughn Hilliard. Vaughn, do the reporting for us. What do we know? Right. Each of these three individuals showed up virtually in the last hour for these arraignments. They were the final three of the 18. Now the entire slate has pleaded not guilty. And so when you're looking at the likes of Boris Epstein, I think it's important to note that he continues to remain a close advisor to Donald Trump and his campaign. He has essentially coordinated all of Donald Trump's legal legal counsel for the various cases in legal uh, legal question marks that uh, have, you know, sort of plagued Donald Trump. Well, now Boris Epstein, he has his own, but each of them entering this uh, a not guilty plea. I don't want to let you hear from the prosecutor from Attorney General uh, of Arizona, Chris Mays' office, talking about the potential of plea agreements down the line. Take a listen. We anticipate, I think, in any other, like any other case that will make plea offers, whether or not we have not made any yet, um, and so, but I have discussed the possibility with some coming with the defense counsel. So we've not made any yet. We've not made any plea agreements or plea offers yet. And so that's a question mark as this process here moves forward, exactly where this heads. And of course, the question mark for each of these individuals is whether they have a motion to sever their cases. So there's still a lot ahead. We shouldn't expect to travel before the 2024 election. Yeah, Barbara, this is a big group. And I think a lot of eyes were on Jenna Ellis going into this hearing since she took a plea deal and pleaded guilty in the Georgia RICO case. But here she pleaded not guilty. What does that signal to you from a defense standpoint? Well, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot, I think, because typically when a person is facing their arraignment, this is the first time they've had a chance to look at the charges. There it typically has not yet been any opportunity for negotiation. Uh, but I suppose the fact that she chose not to contest the charges in Georgia, she actually admitted in open court uh, to committing this crime. Uh, and she's also been sanctioned by the Colorado board uh, authorities, uh, her home state, um, that it seems that she is unlikely to contest these charges. So if you are a savvy prosecutor, this might be someone that you would focus on to try to see if she's interested in not only testifying or not only pleading guilty, but perhaps in testifying against some of the other defendants, because oftentimes you can look like some look to someone like Jenna Ellis and ask her if she's interested in providing information about others, such as Rudy Giuliani or Boris Epstein, people who perhaps are considered bigger fish in the scheme. Yeah, Rudy Giuliani, there's Mark Meadows, who's also part of this group, the 18 co-defendants. Now that all 18 have been arraigned, have pleaded not guilty, what comes next, Barbara? So the completion of the arraignments is kind of an important moment, although the hearing itself is uh, typically uneventful. It's just a reading of the charge, uh, acknowledgement that it's been received, but it starts the clock. This is when the speedy trial clock begins, and this is when parties receive discovery, and so they learn about the strength or the weakness of the case. Typically, when prosecutors are bringing a charge and believing they can prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, the evidence is strong, and that's when the plea wheeling and dealing begins. I think that you can see um, it like a likelihood of looking for lower-level people, perhaps people who simply signed uh, on to the, the false slate, uh, you know, not f fully appreciating the scope of the scheme. Maybe those are the people who would be uh, either people who want to contest their guilt or interested in a guilty plea. I think the other thing to look to is people who are charged in multiple jurisdictions, mm -hmm. because those people have a strong incentive for a global resolution and maybe would be interested in co cooperating in multiple venues. And I'm thinking about the Georgia case, which is indefinitely on hold at this point. Would you expect this case to go to trial before the election? I don't think so. Uh, you know, with uh, 18 defendants, I'm sure there will be a lot of motions get, that get filed. I mean, certainly it's a possibility, but here we are in June. I imagine that with this many defendants, we will see a number of motions that get filed, just as we've seen in some of these other cases. And that takes time for parties to respond, courts to hold hearing, courts to, to issue opinions. And so not impossible, but strikes me as unlikely. I'll tell you the other thing that I think is really interesting here is that although in the federal indictment, 
only Donald Trump is named. He's the sole defendant. There are others named as unindicted co-conspirators, and I think the speculation is that some of the names we're hearing today are also those unindicted co-conspirators. So that's an extra incentive for them to participate in cooperation, not only in the state courts, but perhaps also with Jack Smith in the federal case. Oh, that is interesting. Of course, we're still waiting on presidential immunity decision from the Supreme Court related to that federal election interference case. Barbara McQuaid and Von Hilliard, thank you both so much.